that. So um, uh, it was very surprised me. I didn't know she was going to be here today. And so, but I'm glad she is because I learned so much about uh, adding variety to, to, to bread and everything. And also, um, I'm so excited that uh, she came. Anyway, I'm Patty Alderman from Alderman Farms. Uh, our farm is in Brookhaven, Mississippi. And which Tommy just said that's about 50 miles south of Jackson, down 55. But um, anyway, I I got started in sourdough because I was doing the farmers market, and Tommy's aunt um, did sourdough, and I tried doing sourdough. We're originally from Louisiana, but about I think we figured it was 30 years ago the first time I tried to do sourdough, and it was just a huge flop. You know, it was just I mean it was just it just failed. And so I started doing the market, and I started just doing all uh, different varieties of bread. And I guess it was in that next year I started doing sourdough. And um, I've been very successful with it, and it's went great. And I guess it's Sherry, two years, I guess. This is the second market season that I've really done a lot of different stuff mm -hmm. with the bread that I learned that from you. So I've been, I've been doing the market for 10 years, but just two of the last 10, I've been doing some different stuff with sourdough. And so um, I know some people just want to know how to make bread for sandwich bread and stuff like that, but it's very versatile. And my starter is, uh, it has sugar in it. Sherry does not put sugar in her starter. Um, but, you know, my way is not the right way. It is just a way that works for me. Um, but the, the, my bread's not real sour. And so it goes great if you do it sweet. It goes great if you add cheese, you know. So it's not, uh, it's a medium of the road bread, I would say. But anyway, what I thought I would do is I'll, I'm going to make up some sourdough bread where y'all can see the process and see how easy it is because it's really not rocket science. You just, to me, the most important thing is your starter. And um, even if you don't have a great starter, you can add yeast to your sourdough. And I do add yeast to it because I do make it for the market. And so I'll, I do a 12 hour rise overnight, but then the next morning by adding the little bit of yeast that I add, I get a better, a quicker rise. Within two hours or three hours, I'm baking bread. When, when if I would have not put any yeast in it while I'm making, when I put it in the loaves, it would take, you know, eight to 12 hours it could to rise up. And when I, you know, so I'm doing this for business, I need, I need to be, you know, I don't need to be waiting for the bread. I need to be able to, do it so anyway so I'm going to show you the way I do bread and then you can see how simple have any of y'all ever made bread before and what about sourdough tried I tried, tried. tried. <laughs> okay <laughs> not turn out good okay well it's gonna it's right. gonna you, yep. it, it's, feed it we're gonna yeah well and there's tricks to that too so anyway okay now let me see I'm gonna add into my bowl one and a half cups of water warm water and if you don't have well water, you probably need to use distilled water. Oh, um, yeah. You know, we, don't, we don't think about that often since we're on a well, so we don't have to think about it. I have it written down yeah. to tell them what's going on. Oh, sorry. I'll just be quiet and run no. the camera. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, so when, you're using, when you're using city water, um, it may have chlorine in it. And what you're doing is you're um, wanting a good, uh, the, you have a bacteria that's growing that you want. Did you want any filter water? Oh, is this what is this not well water? Oh, it's okay. It's okay because I'm putting yeast in it. Oh, okay. It's okay. I have a little bit of filtered water. And if it, if it does, that's okay because it needs to be a little warm. So it's okay. But anyway, because if it's a flop, I won't be back in here baking it. If it, if it works, I'm going to come in here later and bake this bread. So, um, right. That was warm water. Yes, ma'am. Just warm water. Does it have to be a certain temperature? You don't want it to be on 105 degrees because you're putting yeast in and it'll kill your yeast. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it, so if it, like if you would feed a baby bottle to a baby, that's how it is. Yeah. That's how you do. And this is my starter. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and put this in, and uh, it actually overflowed my jar. I mean, I, I fed it yesterday and I put it in this bowl with my flour around it to kind of insulated and it overflowed so it's gotten really active so that's but, good yeah that's a good thing we Rejoice call that, when that happens. we call that we say it pratted when that happens because the man in michigan that got the starter from me um that happened to him and so somebody coined the phrase that it pratted so i would call that it all over the place <laughs> okay you want to pass that around where i can smell it here the starter is 
Yeah. Yeah. She'll tell you about the starters, yeah. and I'm pretty sure she has starters to sell today. Yeah, I did. Um, this is, I put a cup of starter in my water. Y'all can see? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like beer. <laughs> okay. How many cups? Um, this is one and a half cups of water and uh, one cup of starter. And also, um, I've got some of our business cards laid out um, on aldermanfarms.net. Um, we have a free download of um, how to feed your starter and also how to make this bread that I'm making. So, if y'all want to get it, but this is a fourth of a cup of sugar. And I use uh, raw sugar or, or you know organic sugar in that. And I didn't do that for the market, but I went ahead and switched over because if I have any bread left, I want to eat it. And I don't. We don't eat white sugar, so. <laughs> All right. And so this this is where my bread's different. This is a tablespoon of yeast, and this is going to have about six cups of flour in it. So I'm really putting only half the yeast that you would put in if you were making yeast bread. You know. So anyway, then I put my yeast in there. What kind of yeast? Is it rapid rise or? Oh, the cabbage is still at Sam's. Any yeast that you're buying at the store now is rapid rise, unless you buy yeast cakes or you okay. simply seek out. That's what people ask yeast. me that. I'm like, I only yeah, you, you have, have to seek it out. You have to be a professional baker to not to know to go get that slow yeast. Okay. So, <laughs> well, I just know some of them. Just the instant rise, the rapid rise, or something that, that, like that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's any what, of it. What they sell that's commercial yeast, basically. Okay, and then we're going to put a tablespoon of salt, and there's a thing that said people, uh, and I tested this, and I saw a friend of mine tested that if you add salt in with the yeast, it makes it where it won't rise, it don't work. That's not true. So, That's not true. in fact, I, Tommy bought me a giant mixer this year, and so I can make, um, yeah, yeah, Sherry was in on that. She helped him know what kind of giant mixer to get me, and so, honestly, and then you got to push, put that bowl up, and it works and then to add anything you got to turn it off and put it down which can be a pain so all this stuff that i've just put in plus the oil i just put it all in there then pull it up and turn it on you know where i don't have to stop it and pull it down and all like that this is i'm using uh, coconut oil right now um i don't do that for the market because most of those people don't care but I care, um, and we may eat this bread. So I'm putting coconut oil in this. I've got coconut oil in all the bread that I've made, and it's worked wonderful um, for that. And so this is a half a cup of coconut oil. And look, it's kind of gotten firm on me. It was liquid. It was liquid when when I put it in here. Must be cooler here than it is at my house. And this won't necessarily, uh, especially if you use regular oil. I've actually done it with butter too. And it works fine. You just need, you know, some kind of. You could use lard or whatever. You know, you want to use lard. Mm -hmm. And so and this doesn't really incorporate great in there. Um, you can still see, you know, how oil and water does, you know. So, but that's no big deal. Now, don't everybody think they could do this this far? This has been really easy, right? So, now I'm gonna mix in my flour, and this is gonna take about six cups. With the sourdough, I'm never precise. Sometimes, now not with doing the six cup recipe. But like when I do uh, the bread that I made here, I did like up to uh, equivalent to making nine loaves. Um, I didn't add all the flour it called for because it uh, didn't need it. So that's one thing that you got to learn about with the, with making bread is is what your dough needs. The last batch of bread I made, what are we calling it, large marge, my big old mixer. Um, I actually it was kind of sticking like to the sides. And I thought, mm, I wonder if I should add more flour, and I did and it was too much flour and my bread was kind of tough. So it makes a difference, you know, if you add It also too much. went everywhere because we forgot to slow it down. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, now I just put, put I all my recipe. Humidity has a lot to do with how much flour you use. Yes. If, if it's cloudy and humid and it's been raining, you would use more flour typically than when it's dry and hot in the middle of the summer. You That's would right. use less flour. So there's it's, it's a science but it's not a hard, fast science. You learn to cook bread tactilely and you will turn out perfect every time by me touching how it feels and how it smells. Mm -hmm. When you get used to making this bread, you can walk in the room and you can smell the dough that's being mixed and you can touch it and you can know where you're at with that bread because you become so familiar with it physically. Yeah. And that's, the, that's how you become a baker. And so if you have a flock, don't give up. Because that's how you learn. Right. Keep trying. 
That's right. right. That's right. And it does. It just depends on, you know, the atmosphere and everything. All right. Now that's four cups of flour in there now. Is that just plain all-purpose flour? Uh, this flour I'm actually ordering from Walmart. It's uh, it's organic, or GMO-free. Uh, all-purpose. All-purpose uh, flour. Yeah. And um, I love it, and it it makes a difference what flour you use. Wheat Montana Farms. Um, I have made bread using all kinds of different flour, and I come back to this because it, it really makes a difference. It's a little bit more expensive, and I actually have to order it from Walmart. That company, Wheat Montana, is an excellent company. They, make, I order my wheat berries from them because I grind, I sprout my berries and then grind my own flour on a weekly basis. They, they, they are very reputable. I was strongly suggest them over the ones that you can get at the big box stores because you don't know how long that flour sits on the shelf in there. And, that and actually right now difference. somebody texted me they're out of stock and so that's like that when they'll be getting some in it'll be fresh you know. Mm -hmm. So okay now I'm going to get my hand in four cups of flour and I'll just do this. I know I'm going to need five cups of flour. I may not need six. So I'm just going to have this cup that I'll take from there. <laughs> and just like um, I was telling you, different recipes di or differ, um, and even how you feed your starter differs. It's not one set way. How people do this is different too. I watch Sherry, and Sherry will throw, put it out on the counter and eat it, and it's like I always have mine. Actually, this bin right here is what I usually make up my dough in because I'm usually making larger amounts and I also have um, a bus uh, tray, you know, the big gray thing, but it's never been but used for busing tables <laughs> that uh, I got at Sam's and that's what I use. But this is the way I do it. I just turn it and incorporate it in. And that's what somebody asked me about kneading it. Um, I just do this until the dough seems right. I don't do it, I wouldn't say I do it for 10 minutes. Um, but when you are working with larger batches, I do. I use my giant mixer now because uh, it is much easier. The giant mixer enables her to do in 45 minutes what it took her two hours to do uh, by hand. It took her and me two hours to do. Yeah, because I used to uh, make enough dough to make uh, 24 loaves, and you would just do 12 in one dish pan, 12 in another dish pan, and so I would say he would, he would get a dish pan too. <laughs> So, and you can always do the window pane test to check to see if you have the balance of gluten. I learned that from you too. Yeah, so. Do you take a piece of the dough and you stretch it and you hold it oh, on my, yeah. If you, if you can see, stretch it thin enough to see through and it doesn't tear, then the gluten is developed properly to make bread. But if it tears, that means you need to need some more. Because you're developing the gluten in the bread is what you're doing. And you're hydrating that flour. What we don't realize when we make bread is that that flour was once a living thing and they dried it and it was dried to make it shelf stable and it has to be moistened and to be able to make good bread and so we don't let our bread sit and get moistened properly and so we don't know how much flour to put in or when to stop and that's why you need to learn tactile because every like every day the weather changes here in the south i mean every day and so you need to know every 15 you, minutes well, and, and, i mean and there's been days where i thought you know i'm gonna have to add more flour and it's so strange that i don't have to add more flour it's just, and i like to you know how our, weather is yeah our bread eight minutes to rest i put the flour yeah, into rest. the point where i feel like i'm good i'll leave it sitting there for about eight minutes go do something else come back and then if it feels right I'll do it if it's too tacky, then I'll add a little bit more flour. And that's, it's easier to be able to add more flour than you can't take it away. Like Patty said, you'll have tough bread. Yeah. If you put too much, it'll be like tough. Is there <laughs> such thing as kneading it too much? Um, I think you can over knead the bread and that, that then that will result in a tougher loaf too, right Sherry? Yeah, the crumb will be really bad. <laughs> I think that might be well, and, and I remember before I had ever made bread, it was just so hard to, to comprehend it. And that's why YouTube's so great. We have got, I've got our cards on the table. And we have tons of videos. Sherry does too on our YouTube channels on how to make bread, how to do sourdough, how, you know, and everything. 
on there. But what you were, what I was talking about is the test where you where you push your finger in if it comes back. If it comes back, yeah. What is that? Is that that's if it's risen properly. If it, if you oh, got that's just risen. Yeah, I thought the window that was about test is where you stretch it out to see if your gluten is developed properly. So if you pump, if you poke it and it comes back out, it's not. If, if, you, if it stay, if the dimple stays in, you you need to let it proof some more. Okay. So. But I'm not a long prooper. I'm not that girl. <laughs> Who's got time for that? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a get her done kind of girl. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you too, with my bread, I tend to err on the side of, of it being a little uh, sticky rather than not sticky. You know, uh, I would, that's just, I prefer it that way. So I'm going to, I tend to add a little less flour than typical. So. So talk about what you're looking for, Patty, to know when you've added well, I mean, enough flour. you see flour. my hands. I'm not, I'm not getting any dough on my hands at all. And um, it just, it's, it's all, it's all together. So you're eliminating the sticky. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna get the sticky and, and, the, and, 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 you know, it's got some bounce to it and everything. So I'm, I'm liking the way the dough feels right now. I, I won't, I, I don't like my dough to be all floury. You know, I like to get the flour all worked in. Um, the way I learned, which was from Tommy's aunt, um, I use oil. Uh, even when like I would shape my dough and stuff like that, I use oil on my hands. I don't use flour because you don't want. I don't didn't want that floury coating. She didn't want the floury coating. Now it's like that's artesian looking, you know, and you want flour on it. So I still don't shape my dough with flour. I shape it, I, and sometimes I really want my dough to where I can shape it without anything. But um, I'll add the flour to it later. You know, when I when I go to do it, I roll it in flour and cut it, and then I have dusted with flour so you know it looks artesian so okay i feel like i'm good with this dough i'm going to pass some around just where you can feel of it and probably as more and more people touch it it may get stickier and stickier i don't know but just where you can have an idea of what the dough feels like especially if you've never made bread you can pinch off another little piece and send it around this way so that because there's a lot of hands in here yeah it may not pass the window paint test. I don't do that. <laughs> um, would you uh, would you mind handing me that jar back there on the table? Hand it back up to me, please. Okay. Now I'm gonna show y'all how I feed my sugar. This is what's very important to uh, feed your starter, and, and it's, it's important too to um, to pay attention to your starter. Sometimes um, I think we're overfeeding our starter. I've had people, you know, feeding their starter every 12 hours when it wasn't doubling in size. There's no reason to feed your starter that much if you're not getting a good rise. Now if that mean, that means once it rises to the top and goes back down, you can feed it then. You know, it's hungry, but you don't want to overfeed it because and I have a hard time explaining it that it's, you know, it, you know, that it's hungry and stuff like that. When you see a little line of liquid across it, you need to feed it, you know, it's hungry. But um, anyway, the starter that I do is a Herman starter. And it, it, it bleh, you feed it with milk, flour, and sugar. And so <clears throat> this starter can be converted over to just a water and flour starter. Um, there's a starter that they do, um, with, with adding uh, potato flakes to it and stuff like that. Um, I've just converted this over, thank you, um, over the years, um, and this is what I find works best for me. I love using the milk. To me, your starter gets active a lot quicker. Now, Sherry, what do you feed? What do you? What is in your starter? I know you do something different than I do. I feed my starter occasionally if it's getting sluggish. I will give it a little bit of um, sugar or honey, mm -hmm. but I usually just flour and water, and I change up the flours that I use. I will use a whole wheat flour. I will use a buckwheat flour. I don't necessarily go to the same flour every time because it adds a depth of flavor to my sour bread, sourdough starter, and some flours ferment a whole lot better. Yeah, rye, for others. instance, is great. Rye makes a wonderful sourdough. And what people don't understand is what you feed that starter 
it, that's what your bread the flavor is going to impart in, in your bread. So in the winter time, I will feed um, rye and spelt to my sourdough starter. And then in the summertime, I'll use white and whole wheat because people want a lighter bread in the summer and they want a heavier denser and they love that aromatic taste and texture that you get in those other flowers. You can use rye, you can use buckwheat, elkhorn. I mean, there's a myriad of flowers yeah. out there available to us now that we haven't had in the past to enhance the flavors. And if you don't want to mess up your original starter, start a starter using a different bread and just have your, you know, and label it so that you can, you know, try them and see what your family likes best. Because you just never know until you try it. That's and, right. you know, you can go to the health food store. You don't have to grind it like I do. You can go to the health food store and buy a small bag of organic, you know, kale corn or kamut or something like that to try just to see if you want something a little so if you're going to do, if you're going to develop several starters, how far apart do you need to keep them? I typically have them in separate kitchens. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, I have an outdoor kitchen that um, that I do a lot of my um, business baking in, and then I have a kitchen in my house. And so what I'll do is I'll rest my kombucha or June in the refrigerator and have my, if I have starters in the house, so my other grain, like I said, if I've got my whole wheat and my white sourdough starter out in my work kitchen, I'll have my other two going in the house. But I see them every day because I'm in both kitchens every day. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, um, now I feed my starter. This is just a little bit of starter left. Um, and so I'm not gonna feed it a whole lot. What I'm gonna feed this starter is a half a cup of milk. That's not yours, do not touch it. And I'm going to feed it a half a cup of flour. E equal amounts of flour and milk. And like I said, this is the way I do it. Other people do it different. They're doing it to where they are weighing, you know, it, it all out. I'm not going to do all that. You know, so anyway, that's just how they, other people do it. And then, so I do half as much of sugar as I've done flour. So I did a half a cup of sugar, so I'm doing a fourth of a cup. I mean, a half a cup of flour, so I'm doing a fourth of a cup of sugar. So, and you just mix this up, and it's important if you're if you're letting this sit out and ferment, it's important that you just cover. I just I like using just a paper towel and a rubber band. That's just it's just easy. Now, if you're going to put this in the refrigerator, what you're going to want to do is um, put a regular lid on, put in the refrigerator. And another thing that I started doing, and I don't know who I learned this from, but I, I seem like I learned from somebody or either I figured it out. I'll get my spatula and clean my jar up because you want to know how much rise you're getting. You know, well, you'll know how good your starter's doing, and and uh, you can always get some rye flour. And I had that written down to say that you can actually change over. You can change over this starter to just a flour and milk starter, or a rye flour and water starter. You know, it can you can change up the starters, and um. You do that little by little. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And if you find that you're start, you're having a hard time with your starter that it's sluggish, and it may just depend on your house, you know, especially like if you get one of my sourdough starters over there, you're going to probably be able to bake bread quicker because you're going to have some yeast in there, and plus it's going to have more of the sour smell quicker because it's already started. Um, in about seven days, you could be making bread or less. Um, and if you started to start at home, it might take a little longer to, be, to really get the rise and to get the smell, but if you add a little yeast to it, like I just did, you can still make bread, you know, with it. You don't have to throw it away. And uh, that's another thing I want to talk about is the, um, what I have started doing with my starter. I'll, uh, I'll actually, like it's my off season right now and I have half gallon jugs. And I have a half gallon jug in the refrigerator that's almost full of starter. And what I do, um, when I want to make bread for Tommy and I, I will take that starter out cold and to put a fourth of a cup in a quart jar. And then I will start feeding it. Uh, my first feeding of that, I might would just feed an eighth of a cup of uh, milk, an eighth of a cup of flour, and two tablespoons of sugar. That would be my first feeding. And then the next day, I would feed 
maybe a fourth of a cup, fourth of a cup, and an eighth of a cup, like that, and do that for a couple of days. After about two days, I have found that starter is ready to make bread. This is once you have a good established starter and you put it up in the fridge. So my point is, is you don't have to have a big jar all the time going on the counter that you're having tons of starter and having to throw it away. You can pull from the fridge. You just have to plan a couple of days ahead of time when you want to make bread. You know, so it's 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 really it's really very versatile to be able to uh, to do that. Um, all right, I'm just going to go over and make sure I shared everything with y'all. Want to share? Um, all right, we talked about not using unchlorinated water, which I may have just done that. But like I said, I put a little yeast in it, so that's going to help. Um, and I told y'all, I find that the meal really makes for a very, very active starter. Um, also, let's see what's in that time for another class to start. I'm going to show you how I make up the bread. Even though it's not risen. Oh, that's what I want to tell you. Typically, I would let this dough rise overnight. I would make it up about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And then in the morning, when I get up, I would put it into whatever loaves of bread I wanted to make. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to show you that. Even though... I'm not, it's not had the correct rise time. I wanted to uh, share with y'all how to do that. And it may or may not do decent bread, but if it don't, that's okay. But uh, this is another tip that I learned from Sherry. I'm so glad she's here. Um, especially with me doing the market, um, I always, I, I'm a pretty good judge to see sizes, you know, and everything, tell if a picture's going on the wall. And so, I mean, it's pretty easy to look at lumps of dough and see one's bigger than the other, you know, type thing and everything. But always when I bake my bread, I have one a little bit taller. You know, of course, all your bigger loaves sold first down to the little shorter ones, you know, and everything. Um, you can weigh your dough, you know. This is about three pounds of dough. It's a little bit more, um, but so it can make three one-pound loaves of bread. And so, anyway, uh, that's how, you know, I've gotten to have more uniform loaves. But anyway, um, one thing that I found this year um, was using parchment paper. I ordered it from Amazon, and it's much, it's, it's much cheaper to do that, and it's so much easier. I don't have to wash all these pans. You see I'm folding this under like this. This is how you would make a, uh, the, to make the uh, big round loaves. You just fold it under and under like that. And... You know, the dough, it's fine. It's not too sticky. This is the, the consistency. I like my dough. But anyway, this is just to make the round. They call it artesian bread. I mean, but it's just... A bull. Huh? A bull. A bull. A bull. Anyway. Uh, uh, now, Sherry, you, like you do... Bull. No, a bull. Like a bull. Like a bull. B-O-U-L. Yeah. B-O-U-L. Oh! And, she, and she, it's so funny. We should have... We should have... You should have been making up dough, too, to show the difference. Because Sherry will go... You know, and all this. I've watched her videos. We shape bread totally differently. That's yeah. okay. That's yeah. totally okay because she she does it in a bowl. I can't do it in a bowl because I'm what my husband calls it. I have um, I have a disease. I have very short arms. And very <laughs> arms. <laughs> my kids call it T Rex arms, but because oh. I have really short arms, so I have to put everything on the counter to work it. I can't work in a bowl. It's really hard for me. Oh, is that why you did it different than me? Because you're short and I'm tall? Oh, yes, you have long, you have arms, yeah, I know. Those practical considerations. I need arm lengthening surgery. <laughs> so, but never had that done. So that's why you, I do it on the counter. Okay, okay. <laughs> Um, then I, I, slide, I cut mine now, and Sherry, I haven't done this, start doing this yet, but she actually uses a razor blade, which does it a lot better. And you cut yours after it's risen, though, don't you? Depends on Depends. which kind of bread. Sourdough, uh, I, I um, cut before, especially when I'm making bulls, because if you cut sourdough after it has risen, you're going to lose that volume in there that you get. From that gas bubbles because you're popping those gas bubbles. So you said you do it before or after? Before, before. Okay. With that. So I and also, if you're going to use whole wheat sourdough, um, I'm going to tell you this, and you can ignore me and not do it, or you can do it. It's just a little tip. Um, if you will put, for how much yeast you decide to put in there or whatever, if you'll put a tablespoon oh. of apple cider vinegar in there, oh, yeah. it will make your bread so much lighter and, and I haven't done the that texture. Yet. You will not taste that. the you will not taste the, 
the vinegar at all, but it gives you a much lighter, it helps the gas bubbles become stronger, and therefore the, the wheat granules can't pop that um, gas bubble and it holds up and it keeps its lift better, so it makes those little gas bubbles a little stronger, so you have better texture crumb and a lighter crumb, which is always great. When, when you add the vinegar. When you're adding your, your wet ingredients Oh, yeah, right at like the beginning. The oil. Yes, right. you add your vinegar right then. And you will never, t I promise you, if, if you don't put a drop of sugar in your bread, you will never taste the vinegar. You won't know it's there. But it is a huge help. But it's a natural dough enhancer. And always apple cider? Or always apple cider with a mother. Don't buy the cheap junk. Yeah. <laughs> this, this bread, <laughs> this is a cheesy bread that I'm making. And um, I took about one pound of my dough and I broke it in half. This is the other half of it and I flattened it out flat like this and then you take it and you roll it up. I learned this from Sherry too. And you have it rolled up and you pinch that together just like you're making a cinnamon roll. And I also make my cinnamon rolls out of this dough also. Now, and y'all remember that this dough should have risen for 12 hours, you know, or at least till it doubled and then do your dough. Then you'll take it and put your seam side down and cut it in half. Now, this is where Sherry and I do things differently, that I start doing something different than what she originally did. She takes this, and it's very pretty and it's a nice presentation. You pinch those ends together, and you're going to twist it over like this. and that's gonna rise up and look fine. This is gonna be a pretty good size loaf of bread like that. But the way I started doing it, it's different. Sharp cheddar? Yeah. Um, this is sharp cheddar. Um, enough. I learned a lot from Sherry. <laughs> She, she, she suggests using mild cheddar because of the flavor, and I do find the flavor is better with the mild cheddar. You can taste the flavor better. I'm going to roll this up the same way, and I'm going to cut it the same. But I'm going to leave my side separate. And to me, this is a nice size bread, um, but um, this, this bread that... It's the same bread. Tommy, get a, one of those breads over there and show them the size that it's going to end up being. Um, I didn't bring my bread blade. I have a bread blade. This makes it easier. I'm going to put this down and see the cheesy bread like that. This I love to make a sandwich on that, and that will rise up to be like that. And it's just, just the right size to me to cut in half and make a sandwich on it. But I, was not, I did not bring out two trays that I should have. I don't have some in the cabinet. Oh, I don't know. I guess I, I might can squeeze it all in. We'll see. It just might grow together. <laughs> Get a giant plate. Yeah. And then this bread here is the my muffalata bread. What do you call it? Do you call yours muffalata bread? I call it olive loaf. Olive loaf. We use different olives. I use catamari. Yeah. Catamari. Whatever. Calamari. Yeah. But well, so learned, far, we may not have called it that too, because so far today, nobody I've talked to. Had ever heard of muffalata? We kind of thought yeah, of it not, baby. Muffalata bread that I make, I make it really rounded and dense. Like a muffalata. Like a muffalata. Yeah. yeah, and it has a lot of different kind of olives in it. This I put, uh, this is just regular olives that I have put in a food processor and chopped up. Um, if it, you don't like olives, you will not like this. So. Make sure you drain your olives oh, yeah, really they have to well be drained, yeah. because it will put more moisture in your bread and it will fall apart and you don't want to do that. And you're going to see this will be a lot harder to pick up and move than the cheese bread. But um, anyway, uh, I also do with jalapenos like this, and I just call it jalapeno, jalapeno cheese bread. And then I use uh, mozzarella cheese on this. And also... Um, about the dough, uh, splitting it into three and make, being able to make three loaves. That's, um, that'd be one pound loaves and that's a smaller loaf. That's not, that's not your normal size bread pan you buy from Walmart, but you know the little metal uh, throw, throwaway bread pans? 
um, disposable ones? No, no, that's a half a pound. That's a half a pound. Mama, where are you going? And I'm going to roll this up the same way. It's a little harder because you've got your wet ingredients and your uh, cheese. A little bit more to handle. I also started doing a pizza loaf like this. I don't put the pepperonis on it as far as, you know, for being able to sell it, you know, uh, the next day and not refrigerate it and everything. But I do uh, do pizza sauce and cheese and it, it really... It really is good. The typical bread pan that you buy at the grocery store is a two pound okay. loaf, but I find that with my breads, if I put two pounds of dough in a typical um, bread pan, I use cast iron lodge bread pans. Uh, it is too much dough and I get over rise and I get this, this form of bread. So I use one pound, eight ounces. A of bread dough per pound two pound for loaf. big loaves, yeah. Because I get the perfect dome, I get the per and it, it it keeps its shape very well. And I can get fourteen slices of bread out of that loaf, but I can slice bread thin. My children told me that. All the time. <laughs> now, are you going to be able to bake that even though it didn't rise? Yeah, I'm going to let it rise again. Oh, oh, okay. And it, I may not get the best rise out of it, but I really think it'll do fine. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it may not be quite as puffy, you know, as uh, it would have been. But I wanted to show, it's hard to show somebody how to do so sourdough start to finish because, mm -hmm. you know, honestly, I would have mixed this dough up, you know, last night and, mm -hmm. you know, and with traveling and all that. that would be so everybody hard. come back here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and the muffalata, I would say, huh, Tommy, by far is our favorite. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is just the beginning. You can take this bread and go anywhere with it. We do uh, fresh basil and sun-dried tomatoes with a little mozzarella and make a tomato basil. We Like it's, like Patty said, she makes a pizza bread. I make a pizza bread. Um, you can do, I make a cinnamon, um, cinnamon raisin bread with this. You can do all sorts of that. Your imagination is the only thing that stops you with this yeah. because the, it's just out there. You can, do, you, can, you can make Christmas bread. You can add breakfast ingredients to it. You can add dried fruit and make a slicing toasted yeah, bread. Yeah, she does. She does. I mean, there's just a myriad of things you can do with this bread. You can make... You can take that dough right there, roll it out, and cut it into English muffins, pan fry them, and then bake them on for 10 minutes, and you have homemade sourdough English muffins. I mean, there is nothing you can't do with this dough that you do with all these other millions of doughs that you can make. That, and that's what, I mean, I want, That's I like the sourdough because to me it's, it's very versatile. It lends itself well to sweet. This sourdough, now, I tasted some sourdough up in Michigan that's really sour, and I don't particularly like that. Um, I don't know how well a particularly sour sourdough would taste going over to sweet. But, you know, I make, like I said, I make my cinnamon rolls out of this. I do a cinnamon, uh, get a cinnamon, uh, twist over there that's made oh, I'm doing, that's made out of this um you know with this dough and it's, it's just not super tart so that's why you know it um uh, I just don't know how a really really sour bread would would lend itself to this so I use, and, and, and I usually space out this stuff better I should have had another I wasn't thinking I should have had another uh pan with me I usually will fit six of these on a pan, but then these two are bigger, so. 